So it's now turned 10 o'clock. I might just do a quick sound check. Is, can everyone hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Or I can at least. Okay, thanks, Wayne. Good to see you back. <laughs> thanks, Sanjin. Okay, good, good. And I've got to type it in the bottom here. Make sure you understand. Yep, thank you for that. <laughs> just getting some notes ready for, for today's class. Okay, so this week's just do a quick roadmap of where we are. So we're looking at swing components this week, and that's all on GUI programming, which I hope you'll find a lot of fun. It'll be a challenge, don't get me wrong, it'll be a challenge for you, but I hope you find a lot of fun because from this week onwards, you can develop applications that are pretty to look at and look like other applications you're familiar with in Windows or Linux or, or your Mac. Okay, uh, not, just, not just console programs. Now, everything you've learned so far still applies. Okay, so you can't forget anything you've learned so far. And, um, you know, you'll, st you'll still even use system out print line occasionally to display, display stuff to the console screen. Okay, so everything, everything we've done so far still applies, but we're gonna use C, the new way of uh, building interfaces. Okay, so last week we talked about arrays and uh, array lists as well, array lists and enums. Um, and this is what we're talking about, swing components. Okay, so let's have a look at the slides. So we'll understand what swing components are. We'll use the JFrame class, the JLabel class. We'll use a layout manager. We'll extend the JFrame class. And we'll add text fields, text areas, buttons to a JFrame. Learn about event-driven programming. Understand swing event listeners and uh, we use checkbox button group and combo box classes and so on to, uh, to build nice interfaces. Okay, so um, batch programming, which is what we've been doing so far, batch programming. Okay, and that's where you, uh, your instructions run, your program runs. That's sort of where your program runs until the end. Uh, if, if a user enters an invalid input, you display an error, and ask them again. You do that, you do that in a loop. Okay. A, a, a sequence of instructions. Uh, and, and the user really has no control of what happens next. Basic instructions. Um, which is the main, the main part I was, I was really wanting to make there. So the user's really got no control up until what we've done so far. What your program does next isn't up to the user. Okay, so the user really has no control of what happens next. And if the user enters an invalid input, you're going to display an error and then ask them again, over and over again. <laughs> ask them. Okay, um, and before moving on to the next input. That's sort of where we've been so far. That's our batch programming. Okay. We're now moving on to event-driven programming, which is quite a different way of thinking. Now with event-driven programs, the program sits there doing nothing until the user clicks a button or a menu, or some event fires off. Like we might have hit the first of the month. Okay, so the program sits there doing nothing until the user clicks a button. This is completely different 
to this paradigm. Okay, so the user, the GUI applications anyway, has full control over what happens next. They decide which button to click. And which menu. Okay, so the program just sits there doing nothing until the user clicks something, is, is, what, is how most of our programs are going to work. Okay, so for our programs anyway. So the user's in control. In, in, uh, in, in the batch programming, which is what we were doing, the program had control, okay? The user couldn't say, I want to enter, I want to enter, um, you know, addresses before names. The user couldn't, the user couldn't jump around and do different things. The program had full control on what was happening. Okay, that's batch programming. With event-driven programming, the user's got full control. Whatever they want to do next, they can do. They can click a button, they can click a menu, they can exit. They can run the program again. <laughs> okay, whatever they want to do. So in this way of working, if the user enters an invalid input, you display an error and stop. No more looping. Okay. The, the most annoying thing you can do to a user is keep looping and looping for input when they want to click on something else and do something else. Okay. So if the user enters an invalid input, you display an error and you stop. Okay. And you wait for the user to choose another. Menu, whatever. Okay, so you can see that's quite a different style of programming. We've, we've gone from this gone from a paradigm where the, the, the program's in full control to a paradigm where the user's in full control. Okay, in other words, in control of what happens next anyway. Okay, so. Okay, so batch programming and event-driven programming. Keep that in mind as we're talking about all this stuff. Okay. And another thing I should probably talk about is, uh, just a little bit of history of GUI programming in Java. So AWT stood for abstract or stands for Node Toolkit. And this provided a set of basic GUI program, uh, GUI components. There wasn't many options. That one. Basic set of GUI components. And that's how people did GUI programming in Java for the first, well, over 10 years. <laughs> Java. Okay. Then Swing came out. And this was uh, all components. More options, better look and feel, etc. Okay, so swing was more powerful stuff. Okay, and then later on after that, JavaFX came out, and that was more again. We even had charts, graphs, a whole lot of stuff. Okay, so JavaFX was really. Uh, another layer above. So Swing was another level above AWT and JavaFX was another level above Swing. Okay. Um, now JavaFX looks like it's being phased out by by Oracle. And of course, don't quote me on that, things change by the day. Uh, I'm, in, I'm, in, I'm in touch with some Oracle devs and they've got the feeling that it's being phased out. But I could be wrong on that and they could be wrong on that. So, <laughs> and of course, things change by the day. In, in three months' time, Oracle could decide that JavaFX is the most important framework. Okay. But for now, it looks like it's being phased out. So, so we teach Swing. 
in this course. We used to teach, we used to teach AWT only, and then we taught AWT and moved over to Swing, but now we just teach Swing. And to do that, we still need, still need some AWT stuff, as we'll see, AWT. So the important thing to think to remember here is it's abstract windowed toolkit, not abstract windows toolkit. If you say abstract windows toolkit, if you're mentioning your application to a Mac user and you mention windows, they'll probably vomit on it. <laughs> okay, so make sure you say windowed toolkit. Yes, Sarah, interesting, interesting breed Mac users, but anyway. <laughs> okay, so this is where we're going. So I'm gonna add some Let's some text fields, text areas, text buttons to a J-frame, learn about event driven programming. So event driven programming, that's what I was talking about here. That's why I went on to this tangent. Okay. And uh, we'll use some other components as well. Okay. So GUI components, they're the buttons, text fields, or other components which make up the user interface. And the user can often interact with them. Okay. Uh, although some of them might just be for display only or, or, or barely even, the user might even know that, not even know they're there, for example, labels or containers. Okay. Um, there's a whole hierarchy of classes in Java. We've, we've barely even glimpsed any of it. And, um, and uh, the swing components are a descendant of the J component class, which comes from AWT anyway. So they're all based on the AWT that I was talking about here. Okay, so Swing is based on AWT and uses AWT. It's just providing more functionality, more options, and uh, more power. To take advantage of the Swing GUI components and their methods, you must import a javax.swing at the beginning. Okay, and I've got a little GUI example here that we're gonna build up as we go through the lecture. Okay, so I'm importing all of Swing. I'm importing all of AWT. I'm invent, importing all of the AWT event handling stuff, which is how, how you deal with button clicks and mouse clicks on, uh, on things. Okay, and I've got a class, and I've got a, 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 an empty main at the moment. Okay, so if anyone wants to follow along at home, you could just type those imports in public class, public static void main, ninja class, and we can do it together if you like. I'll leave that on screen for a little while in case people want to join in. Otherwise, we'll be doing all this in a tube as well. Okay, but I'll, I'll do a live demo as we cover components in class. We'll add them into our GUI and see what it looks like. Okay, so three imports are the main things. I'll be flashing back to this screen a lot, so don't worry if you don't get it all just yet. I'll be flashing back there a lot. So a container is a component that holds other components. And it allows a group of components to be treated as a single entity, if you like. So you can move around on screen or position it on screen using the container, not the individual component properties. Uh, they're defined in a container class. And they often take the form of a window, which you can drag and resize, minimize, restore, close. Okay, so there's a whole bunch of containers in Java. We're gonna be looking at a few of them today. And one of them takes the form of a window and you can resize it and do whatever you like with it. Just like you can a normal window, like I could with TextPad or PowerPoint. Okay, so you've got the, got the little icons in the top left corner. Uh, minimize, restore, max, uh, close, minimize, maximize, close. And you get a little system menu over here. That's all part of the part of the frame class in Java. So the window window class, which is container of which is a child of container or a type of container, and it does not have title bars or borders. So there's no borders on the window class, and there's no title bar and things like that. It's rarely used. Instead, it's used as a a placeholder to move on to more powerful container classes like frame or J frame. And we're using swing, so all of our components just about start with a J. Most of our components start with a J and it indicates they're swing components. 
frame on it, same with that J, that's an AWT component. So it still gives you a frame that you can, you've got the three buttons and you can minimize and all that sort of stuff, but it's not the powerful J frame that we want to use for this course. We're using swing stuff where we can. So there's a part of the hierarchy. <laughs> So the object is a parent of all classes in Java. I've briefly mentioned that before, the object class. And then you've got component container window frame and J frame. So you can see the swing stuff's all built on the AWT stuff. It's just more power, more, more options. And uh, you can control the look and feel better and all that sort of stuff. Okay, we still, we still will be using some AWT stuff, but mostly where there's swing stuff available, we'll be using the swing stuff. So just better. So to create a J frame, so you can place other objects within it for, for display, that's what we're gonna do, we're gonna create a J frame. And the J frame class has four constructors, J frame, J frame string, where you can set a title, J frame graphics configuration, gray frame string title, and a graphics consider configuration. So it's got four options there for you to create a frame. Okay, so J frame is just a class, like we've been creating our own classes, it's just a class in Java, and there's four constructors, so four options for creating a J frame. There's also a whole bunch of methods in J frame. So there's set title, set size, uh, you can set size to an integer, so width and height, or you can provide a dimension, which is uh, a dimension's uh, a point, which has got a, a width and a height. Um, it's got, it's got two values, two integers. You can get title, you can set resizable to true or false. You can see if it's resizable by calling is resizable. You can set visible to true or false. And you can set the bounds, so you can set the size of the, um, of, of the frame as well. Okay, so let's do that. Okay, so the the the, the way I'm gonna the way I'm gonna sh well will I show you this way? Hang on, just a sec. I might show you more the way. We'll just we'll just vary from this slightly, okay? And um, I'll show you more the way that the summits taught you, okay? Which is not the way I I also code my classes. So um, we're we're creating a GUI example, and we say extends. J frame. So this means our GUI class now is now a class that extends the J frame class. So when we run this program, if we run it now, we wouldn't see anything. But uh, if we run it shortly, we will see a frame on screen. Okay, just an empty frame with a title bar and, and the three minimize, maximize, restore buttons. Well, uh, minimize, maximize, close buttons. Yeah. Okay, so we'll come up with that shortly. You can also set the size and set the title. So let's do that. So we want to create an instance of our GUI class. So that's the, we're going to we're going to fire off our GUI class constructor now, and we could we could give it a name if we wanted to. App is equal to new. So we're creating an, a, an instance of our GUI class example, which is going to run our constructor. So we need to add a constructor. So constructor, public, by the name of the class, open curlies, close curlies. That's all we've got so far. So we've got an empty constructor and we've got extends J frame and we've got uh, whatever the class name is. Give it a name, app, or whatever you want to call it, equals new GUI example. We can set the size and we can set the title. Let's do that. So it's whatever you call that object, it's app.setTitle. My first GUI version zero. 
that'll be the title that appears in the title bar. Okay, so I'm just running that code there. And that's it. I'll set the title, now I'll set the size. You can do them in any order, it doesn't matter on the order. Okay, so it's 600 pixels wide by 600 pixels high. Okay. So we should be able to compile now, control one. Okay, so everything's fine, we can compile okay. No point running it yet, our, our app won't appear yet. Okay, so don't, don't run it just yet. <laughs> Could do a little bit more plumbing yet. Not, not much, but a little bit more. Okay, so I've added in the extends J frame. I've added in just an empty constructor for now. And I've created an instance of our class and use that to set the title and set the size. Okay. okay, so that's pretty well what we've got, except we've got extends J frame up here and we've created this a little bit differently. Okay, but we've got very similar code there. I'm just, just showing you the slightly more modern way to do it. Um, and more in line with, with what, the, what the assignment does. So to close a, a window, you click the little close button in the top right corner, the little X up here in the top right. Okay, that's how you close an application. By default in Java, um, Java doesn't close the application, it just hides it and, and, and keeps it running. Okay, so if you run and rerun your application a lot, you might have multiple copies of that application running in memory. And eventually, I guess, if you run enough copies, you could run out of memory, but you're gonna be running millions of copies of it. <laughs> okay, well, thousands of copies. So what we wanna do is change the close operation for your um, application. And you can do that by calling the set default close operation method. So by default, the def default is to hide when you click the X button and keep it running. We want to make it show changes to close or exit. Okay, that's coming up shortly. Mm, okay, so we're not going to do that. So let's do that. App dot set default close operation. frame close okay, so I've, I've, I've called a set default close operation and in here I've provided a constant which is built into Java and I've, I've called it jframe exit on close. There's a whole bunch of constants you can use. The default one is to hide. When you, when you click the X button, it just hides it and keeps it running. This one here will actually exit your application. And the last one we can do, we, we're covering these in slightly different orders to what I'd like in the, in the slides, but we can do that now. Set visible to true. Okay, so I've added set default close operation and set visible to true. This now makes your application visible. Until that point, your application was invisible. Not, not, the user couldn't see it. Okay, so, so by default, when you run Java applications, your application is invisible, which is interesting. Um, and so it gives you a chance to build it before it sh shows up on screen. So the user's not seeing all the components fly everywhere. Uh, you know, so, and things resizing and all sorts of things. So the idea is that you build your application up here in the constructor, you build the GUI, and then it flashes onto the screen, everything's all be beautifully built and ready to go. Okay, so let's run that. We can now run this code. Control one, control two, and you'll see there's a frame. Woohoo! So our first GUI, it's running. So with the title bar, we can resize the window. Okay, and we've got the three icons up there. And when we click this one, Textpad will display a little message for us. Um, when I click that one, and it'll say, 
request an interview to, to continue, which is what TextPad does when it runs our programs for us. And that proves that the, the application has exited. It's not still running. Okay, so we're all good to go. Okay, oh, and the other thing I'll talk about as well, just briefly, is you can put these commands here. You can also put them up in your constructor. So you could do this if you wanted to instead. Okay, but of course, now you're talking about the current object, so it's not app dot. Okay, so you could take them out of down here if you wanted to. Put them up here in your constructor without the app dot. It's just set title, set size, set default close, set visible. And everything will still run exactly the same. Control two. Okay, so everything still works the same. So some, some people prefer, prefer them up here. Some people prefer them down here. Some people put some of these down here and some of these up here. Depends on what you want to do and what standards you want to follow. Okay. Um, I'm going to leave all mine up in, up in here for now, just for fun, but it doesn't matter. You can leave them down in your main if you want to. Okay. I'll also move them so that the last lines of code in my constructor so that I do all the building up here. And then the last thing I do is make it visible. So the user doesn't see components flying all around the screen <laughs> and resizing and all stuff going on. Okay, so um, to make that set visible true is the last thing you want to see. Because otherwise you can see stuff moving and changing. It looks a bit funny when a user sees it. Especially if you're doing resizes and set positions and stuff. Another one you can call, which is really useful, is set position, set position. And you can say um, 200 pixels in the left-hand corner of the screen, uh, 50 pixels there in front of the top, and that gives you the, the, the position of the top left corner of the uh, of, of your frame. So set position. That's another one that we haven't covered yet. Control one. Sorry, set location, not set position. Set location. Set location. Sorry. And there it is, so it's appearing right here now, whereas before it used to appear up in the corner and I had to drag it down. Okay, so it's much better. I might even make that 250 and 100, just to make it suit my screen a bit better. Same, you keep shifting the windows when it runs. And that's much better, it appears right there. Okay, so some of those commands. Um, so with, with AWT and particularly with Swing, you can have a lot of control over how your application looks. So over windows decorations, over icons and buttons, over the look and feel. You can have metallic look and feels. You can have all sorts of beautiful look and feels, really silvery, classic, sleek look and feels. By default, it's not too bad. We're just using a default look and feel at the moment. That's not too bad. It's sort of a, it inherits your windows or your, your current operating systems look and feel um, where it can. And uh, so that's looking pretty good, I guess. You know, but you can make it so it looks really beautiful. Some people are really fussy about the user interfaces and some people are really skilled at making beautiful user interfaces. I'm not. Okay. For me, if it works and it's fairly neat, that's good enough. <laughs> I don't have an artistic bone in my body. So for me to make a beautiful user interface is very difficult. I have to spend hours and hours on it. Okay. But uh, as long as it works and it's functional and it's clear, that's all we're looking for in this course. So you can play around with set default look and feel and all these options that are in that area for hours if you want. There's a whole lot of options you can do. So if you're not happy with the basic Java look and feel, don't worry, you can change it. Okay, so you can set decorate look and feel as well as true if you want. We might, we might as well do that as well. Or we can do it in the constructor up here or we can do it down there, both are equally the same. Any order, it doesn't matter. You probably wanna do it before you go to visible to true. So set decorated. Feel to true, although I usually just leave that out. I'm, I'm happy with the, the basic look and feel. Okay, but you can put that in if you like. I'll just make sure it's the case right. Set decorated look and feel. Yep, uppercase. Set decorated look and feel. Yep. Control one. Set decorated look and feel. Ah, oh, look and feel decorated. <laughs> That's what you get when you're typing on one slide and looking on, a, on another screen. Set default look and feel decorated. Okay, so it's quite a, quite a mouthful. Still, I haven't got it right. I want to take it out. 
I've obviously spelled something wrong there. I can't be bothered. I never use it anyway. I think, I think I've typed that in probably once or twice in my life. Okay, so let's move on to labels. So labels are display only. They can hold text or anything you like uh, that you can display. So you can display images in them, you can display text in them, you can display HTML in them. Okay, and there's a whole bunch of methods there. Uh, the main, main ones we'll use are set text and get text. So when you think about a label, set text and get text. Let's add a label to our user interface. Ooh, okay. So we'll go up here to our, our GUI components section. I'll go J label, heading label, equals new J label. We can provide the text if we know it, or else we can just declare the label and set text it later on. We'll just, we just we know the text. So let's say what the heading's going to be. Um, in my app, please click a button. I don't know. I'm just putting in a, a heading. And then over here, I can go add. It's in my constructor now, add heading label. So I've declared a label. J label, heading label equals new J label. It's uppercase J, uppercase L equals new J label. And then this idea of just given some text inside quotes. Okay. And then down here for building the user interface and out the constructor, I just say add heading label to the screen. Okay. So we can now compile and run, control one, control two, and there's our label appearing. Maybe not where you expected. You might have thought it would appear up here in the top left, or maybe the center. Okay, but it appears down here. Don't worry, we're coming onto all that. Okay, there's a whole lot of stuff we can do here to control where things appear, and we're just getting started. Okay, before we move on, any questions on anything so far? Any questions on any of the code so far, or? Anything I've said so far, or anything in the this, in this slide so far? No questions? Okay, we've got eight people, which is great, eight people. Hopefully, you hope, I, I know Wayne's probably following along. I just hope, uh, you know, probably, probably Sanjin and Jared are as well, and the others. Hopefully, some people are joining along. Otherwise, we'll do it all in this week's shoot as well, don't worry. Okay, so we don't, we're, we've created a label, they're display only, and we've used the, the one of the constructors to set the text. If we want to change the text at any time in any of the methods or anywhere in the class, we could say heading label dot set text. Hello world. And that would change the text to hello world. And we're doing that in, in the constructor before our app interface even appears. So we'll just see hello world. We won't even see that message. That won't even appear for us. So control one, control two. And there it says hello world. Okay, so you can change it anytime you like with set text. You can get the text of a label with get text and so on. So you can also display images in labels or text in images. You can do a whole lot of stuff. You can also do HTML. Let me just give you a quick example of some HTML. I haven't done any HTML, don't worry. Okay, I'm just doing a little bit of basic HTML. I've been listening off, off the top of my head. <laughs> row, row one, call one. Let's be row two, call two. I'm just on this off the top of my head. Row two, column two. So I'm going to change the column marker, close column marker slash TD. Close the row marker slash TR. Close the table slash table. 
the ending slash HTML on that slash HTML. That'll do us. Now you see there's a little bit of HTML appearing there. So you've got the heading and all that sort of stuff. So you can use HTML in your stuff as well. Uh, I'll just make it so our border equals one. Make sure the border shows up. Border equals one. Control one. Control two. So now we've got the borders on the table. So you can do all that sort of stuff really easily as well. Now with, HT with HTML, you've got to be very careful. There's some characters you can't put in here because HTML doesn't understand them. And you've got to make sure there's no spaces there. Control one, control two. If there's spaces at the start, your HTML doesn't work. And I battled with that for an hour one day, <laughs> wondering why my HTML wasn't working. And boy, was I unhappy when I found out that it was a, I had a space at the start and that, and that made it stop working. So watch out for your space if you're using HTML and labels. It's got to start with this HTML tag. Boy, was I angry. Because <laughs> there's nothing in the help that mentions that. Well, not that I found. So no space. Okay, cool. Uh, is normal markdown supported? Yes, so you can, you can use CSS as well. Yep. You can do CSS stuff, yep. There are limits. There are limits. Um, but now I've, I've used H, uh, HCSS as well, yep. yep. That was Byron, thanks Byron. So there's a whole lot of stuff you can do. You can, you can um, have different headings, have, have page breaks, uh, paragraph breaks, line breaks, all sorts of things. You can display text in pre-formatted stuff. You can do a lot of the HTML stuff. It's a lot of it's supported. Um, and I've, I've, I've had strings of HTML that are pages long getting displayed in labels. And you add the label to a scrolling frame, and then you can scroll through the label, just like it's a web page. It's beautiful. Okay, so keep that in mind. It's quite useful. There's a number of approaches, you're quite right. Uh, there's a font class as well, so you can, um, you can create uh, objects that contain a font and a size and, and the style. So you can have bold, italic, all that sort of stuff. And um, there's a set font method for changing fonts. So you can declare fonts and change fonts really easily. Uh, there's an example here, declaring a font called heading font equals new font, Arial font bold. Point size is 36. And then we've got a greeting, which is a label. And then we're saying greeting.setFont to heading font. Okay, so it's pretty easy to change fonts. We can do that as well. I might take out the HTML just so it doesn't confuse things. Keep in mind, it must start with no spaces. <laughs> I'll put a warning there. cost me about an hour one day. I had a huge, huge thing of HTML and all of a sudden it wasn't formatting and without me realizing I'd put a space at the start of it. Whew. What a crazy error. Anyway, um, so we're going to do a font. So font, um, heading font, Ooh, new font, courier, courier, new, font.bold, 72, I'll say like heading label dot set font. Do that heading font. I'm not doing HTML anymore, so this should still be the label that appears. Uh, font bold, lift off the ED, control two, and there it is there, so big we can't even fit it all in. <laughs> okay, so. So setting the fonts really easy in Java. Um, and there's a whole lot of stuff you can do that we won't even get to. Okay, so setting the font if you need to. Okay, so layout managers. Layout managers. Uh, 
in Java, we'll talk about we'll talk about we'll probably talk about two or three basic layout managers. There's flow layout. Like like words on a page, and when when you resize the window, um, all the words wrap around to the next line that can't fit on. Okay, so it's, it's like that sort of thing. Flow layout. Then there's border layout. And that's got five regions. There's the north. East, west, center. Okay. And there's a grid layout. They're probably the three layouts we'll use. And that's like a like a like a grid of there's a whole there's a whole heap more layout managers in Java. There's there's box layout, which I really like. Box layout. I use that, I, I use box layout a lot. Grid bag layout, a whole bunch of other ones as well. Um, and there's third party ones as well. You can use like Meek layout and all sorts of other ones that are really good. Okay, so we can do everything we want to do with just these three. Okay, so flow layout, border layout and grid layout. By default with Java, for a JFrame with Java, the, the default layout is border layout. Okay, so when I go add here, I'm not specifying a region of the screen, so it's adding it to the center region by default. Okay, but when I run the app, you might be saying, but it's right over there on the left. That's not being added to the center. It's because we're not using the, the, uh, the west region, we're not using the west region over here. So the center region expands to fill the whole screen. So I could also say this. It would be exactly the same effect. Control one, control two, and there it is, exactly the same. Okay, so by default with JFrames, border layouts of default. So let's just add that in. Uh, the default layout, default layout manager for JFrame. So if you don't specify another layout manager, it'll be a border. Normal default behavior for JFrame, it divides the default container into regions or screen into regions. And the flat layout manager places components in a row and they wrap onto the next line if they need to. When you create a class that descends from the JFrame class, you can set the JFrame's properties within your objects constructor, which is what we're doing here. So we're, ex we're extending the JFrame class, so we're descending from the JFrame class. We're building on top of the JFrame class. That's what extends means we're building on top of that existing class. So we can do all the GUI development in our constructor if we want to. So that's just what that slide's saying. Okay, you can set the JFrame's properties within your objects constructor. Then when the JFrame child object is created, it's automatically endowed with the features you specified. And we're, we're giving it properties and we're giving it some components. And when, it, when our, our JFrame appears, it's automatically endowed with those, in, those uh, those features because we added them here and the add command. Uh, you create a child class using the keyword extends and you call the parent classes constructor using the keyword super. Okay, so we've got the extends there. We're creating a, a child class based on the JFrame class. We're creating a we're creating a GUI which is a JFrame basically is all that means. Okay, so you can see they're using constants for the height and the width. That's something I really like. So instead of hard coding these sorts of numbers, especially setting the size, location you might not really worry about too much, but, but the size you might change quite often depending on whether you're adding more components and stuff. So I would generally make those constants at the top of my program. So let's do that. Just, just say so I've got some constants there. Public, final, public static final. Int max width six hundred max height is five hundred and I'll use max width down here with my set size and I'll use the max height of five hundred down here 
Okay, so just put those in there instead of the 600. 600, I'll put max height, max width and max height. The location is just where it appears on the screen when you first run it. And generally that's fine to leave it like that. Whatever value works well for you. 50, 50 or 0, 0, or whatever works well for you. Okay, you can make those constants as well if you like. And of course, that might be a good thing to make a constant. Okay, so it's really easy to change your version number and, and your application name. So let's do that. Public, public final string. And version. And of course, as soon as I do that, I've got to line everything up. I've got uh, I've got issues on that. So we'll use our app name and version down here in our, in our set title. App name and version. So I'm using that constant there. You know, set title. Okay, so it just makes it easy to change your version number. You have to scroll down through all your code. You just scroll to the top of the class and change that whenever you need to update it. Okay, so that's this. this these are the sort of constants I have at the top of all my classes, all my all my GUI classes. Um, and you might notice on the slide there, they're called super with a, with a, with a label. Okay, and there's no set title. Okay, so no set title and they're called super. That's the other way you can set the title of the of the of the application. So I could say up here, super, and then take out the set title. This would still set the title of my application. Okay, so control one, control two. Okay, so there it is, the title still being set. And I'm not calling. I'm not calling set title anymore. That's all commented out. So it's done it via the super call. So we're calling the super class constructor. We're getting into uncharted territory here. We're calling the constructor that's part of the JFrame class, and we're passing a string. And in Java knows that means we want to set the title to that string. Okay. That are, there are rules for this. And it must be first line of code in your constructor. It must be the first line of code. Control one. If I try and put at the heading label up above it, so now this isn't the first line of code. Control one. And we get an error saying, Call to super must be the first statement in a constructor. Okay, so that means we've got a line of code before our super call. Everything's fine again. Okay, that must be the first line of code. You can have comments before it, but it must be the first line of code. Okay, so do you like doing it that way? Or do you like doing it with set title? I tend to prefer set title. Because set title I can position with all my other set size, set location. I have them all together in a group and um, I like keeping those all together. Okay, so I don't, I don't usually call super. Okay, but you might see it, so that's explained. There's an exit on close, that's what we've already covered. Set visible to true, height and width and so on. Everything's like we've already done. Uh, in addition to labels, there's text fields and buttons. And you can have tooltips, so when the mouse hovers over things, you can have a, a little pop-up bubble appear with a little bit of extra help in it. Um, okay, so before we move on to those, let's just create some more labels. Uh, we'll have the um, name label. The name. Each label, and we'll have into age. We might, I'll leave my that. That's fine. Yep. So into, into name and, and age. So it's just two more labels. And I won't make it so the fonts not as big. I'll, I'll leave the font out for now. Go 
I'll need the font out because we want all these things to fit on screen. I want to show you them wrapping them. Whereas if I have the font that big, uh, it's it's going to uh, it disappears off the screen. You can't see stuff. So I'll, I'll just take I'll take out the font stuff for now as well. Okay. Let's add the name label to the user interface. Add name label. Let's add the age label. Age label. So I didn't specify a region here. So where will they be added? Can anyone remember what I said earlier? If you don't specify a region, what's the default region for border layout? Center. Sorry, I didn't, didn't catch that one. Center. Center, that's right, center. So what will we see on screen? Will we see three labels? Just the last one you added. Oh, Wayne, you've... Okay, so uh, Wayne's obviously been doing extra work and reading ahead, <laughs> which is excellent. Well done. But um, most people would think you would see the three labels. And that's certainly quite logical to think that. Let's, let's just run it and see. And all we're seeing is into age. So where's the other labels? They're not there. I can expand and shrink as much as I like. They're not there. They're gone. Okay. And that's because the border layout, each region of the screen, the east, east west, north, south, centre, can only contain one component. Can only contain one component. Okay, let's change our, let's just get rid of that for now, the border layout center. I'll comment it out. I won't change anything, but let's set our layout to flow layout. Set layout. So by default, it's border layout. Let's set it to flow layout. New flow layout. Now our user interface or our frame has got the uh, quite right Byron. I saw Byron's answer. Yep, Byron Center, he got it right too. Um, so we've made it flow layout instead of border layout. So we're overriding the default behavior for the for the um, for, for a JFrame. Okay, so flow layout. This is the layout, remember, where everything just wraps around like words. It's word like words on a page. If it can't fit on that line, it wraps down onto the next line. Let's run that. Control one, control two. And if I shrink my window up, you'll see, see our end age drop down to the next line and then end of name drops down to the next line. So you can see as I, as I resize things, so things are wrapping around. It's not really useful yet yet because we don't want them all up in the heading area um, and we want them down here with their, with their text fields where we can type data entry. But we'll come on to all that shortly, okay? So we're coming on to improving things as we go. Okay, so we'll just leave it as set flow layout for now. And also, it's centered by default. So flow layout centers things by default. You can, if you want to change that so it's uh, left, you can go flow layout dot left, and that makes everything left, left justified by default. Okay, so everything's over there on the left. And when, I, when it wraps to a new line, it's over on the left, it's not in the center anymore. Okay, so there's a whole lot of default behaviors and you can over there write them usually with putting stuff like that inside round brackets when you call their constructors. Okay, we want everything centered, so I'll leave it centered for now. So I could make it centered like that if I wanted to, but the default layout is centered, so you can just leave it out if you want to. Okay, so everything's centered. Okay, um, so let's look, go ahead and look at text fields and buttons and things and we'll add them into our user interface. So a text fields for data entry or display. So they can be inputable if you want users to be able to type into them. Otherwise you can call a set editable method and pass it a false. And that means the user can't type in anything. So then they become display only. So by default, they're editable. You can type data into them, uh, but, you can, but you can turn that off if you want to make them display only. Okay, so. Let's just look at, uh, so Byron's got a question there. Let's have a look at that one. So for border layout, wouldn't you need to group the three labels into a single, yes, exactly right, into a single frame or, or group to get, to get them to show in the same region. Um, yes, that's exactly right, Byron. Uh, we, we haven't done panels yet. We're gonna move on to that a little bit later in, in the class. Yeah, but, um, so what we're gonna do to make these 
um, these three components appear in a, in a single border layout region. So we add them to a frame or a panel, which has got a different layout, and add that panel to the to the center region, for example. But we're coming on to that. We don't want to jump too far ahead. Yeah, that's quite right. Okay, so text fields, let's do a J text field. So uppercase J, uppercase T, uppercase F. We've done the import for all the swings, so it's already already included. So we just declare a text field. So we'll have a J text field. Name text field equals new J text field. Add an age text field, age text field. This drives me crazy. Oh, I've got to line everything up. I've got problems, I know, but uh, <laughs> everything's got to be neat for me. Otherwise, I like fingernails on a chalkboard. I've got, I've got issues here, I know. We've still got eight people. That's good. We've got eight people with us. So we've got a name text field and, a, and an age text field now. Let's add those to our user interface. So I want the heading label. I want the name label. Then I want the, the text field for the name label. So the text field next to the label. And then I want the age text field next to the age label. So it's just on the order you add them. You can't say I want to add this item to that position or this item to that location or in, in that order. All you can do is add them in the, in the order you want them. That's all you can do for this, for this flow, layout, flow layout. Okay. There's other component, there's other layout managers later, like grid bag, where you can say I want to add this component to that region and this component to that region. But uh, we're using flow layout where you can't do that. Okay, so now we've got label, a heading label, a name label, a name text field, an age label, and an age text field. Let's run that, see how we look. Control one, control two, and there they are. You can barely see the text fields, they're so skinny. Okay, and when I resize the window, it doesn't help when I shrink the window, they're still super skinny. Okay. So we need to, there's many ways around this. The easiest way for us at this stage is to just enter a number inside the brackets here. So let's say you want a text field that's about 30 characters wide. 30 characters, so you just type in 30. Okay, so the user can type gigabytes of data into that text field, but all we'll see is 30 characters. So we can use the arrow keys to scroll through it. Okay, and um, so that you, they, they can hold like two gigabytes of data or more. Uh, but only, only, only 30 characters will be visible at a time. For age, ages tend to be quite short. I want to make that a five character wide text field. Okay. Why don't I just make it two characters? Um, you know, not, not, not many people are going to enter over 100. So I could maybe enter it into three characters. Well, that's an approximate size. Okay. Depending on font settings and italics and all that sort of stuff, um, it's approximately 30 characters is, is visible. Approximately three characters is visible. Okay, so it all depends on what the size. I tend to make them a little bit bigger than I need, so five characters is fine. 30 characters is probably fine now. Maybe 40 if you want to make it 40. Okay, for that one. So control one, control two. And you can see our text fields are coming out. And maybe not watch what you expected. See the so the age label in the text field can be on different lines. Again, the the age label, enter the name label in the text field on different lines. So it's pretty messy and it wraps around all over the place when the size has changed. But we're going to fix it. Don't worry, we'll come on to that and fix it later in the class. This, this is what Byron was talking about. We can add our components to a region or a frame or a panel and then add the panel to the user interface and things will be a lot neater. Any questions so far? Anyone got any questions on anything so far? I know it's a brave new world. We haven't done any GUI before. Okay, anyone want to see any code? Anyone want me to scroll through the code or talk through the code again? Okay, everyone's happy? Okay, good, thank you. What does the number after the um, J text field Represent. Okay, that's um, that's that's the that's the approximate width of the text field in characters. Um, what what's the unit? It's characters. So let's run it. And my my, my age had a width of five characters. So if, if I type in A B C D, mm -hmm. E, I've, I've got five characters there. 
but it's really catering for the for the widest character. So I could type in five X's. And again, it, it tends to overestimate. I can type in many characters, as many as I like, two gigabytes or so, and just scroll through them with the arrow keys. But it's about approximately five will be visible at once. Okay, but it's of course uh, it's not accurate because it, it I think Java tends to overestimate as well because you might have different fonts and italics and all sorts of stuff. It doesn't want things truncated, so it's approximately five characters in width. Whatever your, whatever your current font is for that component, it's approximately five, if you say five, but you might actually be able to see seven or 10 if you use lowercase. So it all depends on what, you, what you're typing in and what your font is and all sorts of things. Okay, but it's just an estimate, approximately five characters wide. Okay. And of course, if we type digits, eight's probably the widest digit. Five, six, seven, eight. So we can see we can see seven characters there, really. So Java has does tend to provide a little bit more as well for us, which is good. Okay, so good question, though, Sanjin. That's good. It's also text areas, and text areas are where you can display multiple lines of text. So a text field is one line of text. Text field, one line. Text area. Many lines, as many as you like. Okay, and you can also specify the size and you can use various methods. There's set text, there's get text, they're the two you'll most use the most. You can also append text on if you want and you can also make it read only or not depending on whether you say set editable. Okay, so let's add a text area in. J text area. I'll call mine uh, output text area. It was new J text area, and I'll just say that I'll just say the size of the text area. So I, I want it to be uh, characters across and around about ten rows high, sixty by ten or twenty rows high, whatever you want to do anyway. Sixty by ten, sixty by twenty, doesn't really matter. So I've called mine output text area. Okay, so J text area, output text area equals new J text area. And then give it a size, whatever you want to do, whatever size makes sense to you. So it's the number of rows approximately, or number of columns approximately, the width and characters, by the number of rows high. So 60 characters wide approximately, by 20 rows high approximately. And we know that to the user interface. Eight, add wherever we want to add it. So we want to add it after the heading line, we'd put the add up there. Okay. If you want to add it after the last text text field, add it down there. Depends on where you want to add it, depends on where you put the add command. Okay, so I've added that, added that in there. And I've also added the, the J text area line up here. Okay, control one. Control two, and you'll see there it is appearing. A bit of a beast. And you'll see I've got the coordinates mixed up. It's not the number of, uh, the 60 wasn't the number of columns, it was the number of rows. So a lot of things it's width and then height in Java, but for some things it's height then width. And this is one of those examples. So 20 rows would be good, and 60, 60 chars would be better. Okay, so a lot of things in Java are width and height, but this thing it's height and width. Okay, so there we got the text area coming out. And you can see, even when we wrap the window, we can have a little text field down here if you put it at the right size. The text field can appear down there. And, uh, and then the label's up there, so it's really quite ugly. <laughs> but don't worry, we're gonna fix all this soon. That's our text area. So it's height in rows and width, approximate width in chars or chars at the current uh, font setting. Okay. And I think I found that was a bit a little big, so I might make it, uh, I might make mine 50, just make it a little bit the right size, 50. Yeah, 
That's that's fine. I have to resize the window to see the edges now. Fifty works good for me. Just just sort of play. It's all, all a matter of playing and seeing what looks good for you. The text area. Um, so you can use set text to write to overwrite what's in the text area. You can also call a constructor which provides the initial text if you know what that is. Um, uh, you've got the append method if you want to, or get text and set editable. So we might have a play with set editable. Set editable. We'll make that false. So by default, text areas are editable. Editable. And you can make them so they're false, so they're not, the user can't type into them. So control one, control two. And you'll see now if I click on a text area and type, I can't type into it. I left off that command. If I left off that command we just did, and rerun, control one, control two, you can see I can type into there whatever I like, just like Notepad. If you don't want users to type into something, a text field or a text area, just go whatever it is, dot set, set editable to false, and they can't type into it anymore. Uh, if you wanted to set the text of a text area, dot set text, set text. That, 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 that'll now appear in the text area, and that code is getting run in the constructor, so that code will appear when the text area first appears. And there it is there. Okay, so just because it's read only for the user, you can still use set text and get text and append for the text area, even though it's read only for the user. So we'll play around with that more in a second when we've got the, we'll add some buttons in and we'll make so the user can type in inputs and we'll add it into the, into the text area. Okay, so that's all coming up. So a button is something that reacts to mouse clicks. There's five constructors and there's also set text and get text. So with labels, set text, get text. With text fields, set text, get text. With text areas, set text, get text. With buttons, it's set text, get text. So we've got um, overloaded methods. If you call set text for a button, the button's text gets set. If you call set text for a text field, the text field's text gets set. Okay, so set text, get text. Just remember those two methods and you'll be able to do just about anything. <laughs> and you can add to easy, add, add the method to, uh, add the button to a frame. Okay, let's do that. So let's add a J button. Add button. Equals new J button. We'll give it a label of clear. Oh, sorry, add. And we'll, we'll, we'll add another button while we're at it. We'll add another one called clear. All this up, up above you. I can't even look at those fingernails on a chalkboard looking for all that messy stuff up there. So I've got to, I just got to focus down here. I'll, I'll have to do that one. But scroll down a little bit so I don't have to look at that top bit. <laughs> yes, I've got issues. <laughs> Okay, so we've got two new buttons, add and, cl add and clear, clear button. Okay, so add button. Let's add that to our user interface and we'll add them after the text field or after the text area. Add, add button, and we'll add new button. So I've created two new buttons and I've added them to the user interface. And let's run and compile. So now we've got our buttons there. Okay, when I click on them, nothing happens because we haven't, we haven't allocated any code to them yet. So we'll do that next. Okay, so we've got the buttons there and you can see they're clickable. They want to do something. <laughs> they're, they're trying to help us, but they don't know what to do yet. We haven't told them, so we need to tell them what to do. Um, so, when click, no resulting actions occurs because we haven't written the code to handle the clicks yet. So that's coming up. 
tooltips. You can also have tooltips, and then little pop-up windows that pop up next to things um, when the mouse hovers over a component. And you can control how long it has to hover. You can control a whole lot of stuff. Uh, but it's all done basically with a set tooltip tool text method. So let's add some, let's add uh, some tooltips to our buttons. So add button dot set set tool. So make sure you get the right take case tool tip text uppercase T's tool tip text. Lessons details to the results or output. And for the clear button, we'll say it clears an area. Okay, set tooltip text, set tooltip text. And that's it. Control one, control two. Now when the mouse hovers over these buttons, see the little pop-up appears? It's hidden under my big mouse pointer, but um, the pop-up's still appearing, see? So you can set tooltips really easily in Java. Set tooltip text. That's all we did there, just those two lines of code. Okay, any questions so far? Any issues? Everything okay? Okay, we're almost at the stage now where we can activate the buttons. So event-driven programming. Remember I said earlier about event-driven programming? The program just sits there doing nothing until the user clicks something, okay? And if there's an error, you display an error message and then stop. You don't keep bombarding the user with errors asking them to type the input again. Just display an error and stop because the user might fix the input or they might click over here and do something else. So. Just let the user decide what to do. You've got to really, got to really step back and let the user control things when you do event-driven programming. So event-driven programming or GUI programming. And, and um, this is batch programming is all to do with console apps, really. Apps without buttons and menus and stuff like that. Okay, so an event occurs when the user takes action on a component, such as clicking the button on a, on a, on a button, clicking the mouse on a button. Uh, you can have left mouse clicks, right mouse clicks, middle mouse clicks, mouse wheels, mouse wheel clicks. You do all sorts of things. There's a whole lot of button events you can handle. As, as many as you can think of, they're, they're there, they're supported by Java. Um, you can do double clicks and all sorts of things. An event-driven program is a program in which the user might initiate any number of event, events in any order. They might do something and then to change their mind and do something else. They might click one button and then when they get an error, they'll say, oh, I'll do this then, I'll click, do something else over here. So it's up to the user to decide what they want to do. It's event-driven, events driven by the user. User-driven programming is probably a good name for it. Uh, this the source, and that's the component on which the event occurred or was generated. So when a user clicks a button, the button is the source of the event, and a listener is an object that's interested in the event and that acts on the event. So you've got sources, which are the source of the event, listeners, which are the things that listen, and uh, for, for mouse clicks, for example, or button clicks, okay, and then there's responders, which take action. So to respond to user events within any class, you must, prepare, you must prepare your class to accept event messages, tell your class to expect events to happen, and tell your class how to respond to events. So prepare your class, tell your class what events you expect to happen, and tell your class how to respond. Now I'm probably going to show you some really old code here. We're not going to write it this way. I want to show you the modern way. Okay, but this code coming up is going to be the old way, which is really complicated. So you need to import the Java AWT event, which is what I had at the top here. So AWT event. That's what handles all the button and menu clicks in Java and other things as well. Okay. And there's a whole lot of ways you can handle things. Um, I don't want to 
go too far too too quick. So awg.event.star, just bring all of that in. And you can do it the old way, which is implements action list at the top of your class. And then you provide action listeners for each button, or you can provide a communal action listener for all your buttons. And that was the old way to do things. Okay. So implement, implementing action listener means you provide uh, an action uh, performed method, which deals with events. So you do add action listener, and for example, to activate a button, you go add action listener this, and that causes any event, action event message or button clicks that occur to be sent to the object that handles the listeners, that's the listener for the, for the button. Okay, so a little bit confusing. Let's have a look at some code. And I'll, I'll show you the old way, which is a confusing way. Then I'll show you the new way, which is much simpler. The action listener interface contains the action perform method. And that's where you specify the body of the method and so on. Uh, when more than one component is added to and register to a J frame, you can either handle them all inside a communal action event method or action performed method. Um, we got if statements saying if it was this button, do this, if it was that button, do this, if it was this button, do this, you got that sort of code going on. And we're actually gonna have an action listener for each button separately. So all the code is isolated and you can't have side effects. And that's a much better way to go. Okay, but we'll, we'll do things the way they, the way they do it in the, in the assignment and the basic way, and then I'll show you the modern way, which is so much simpler. So when you've got a communal listener, you might use get source to find out what the source of the click was. And you can say if get source is equal to the add button, then you can do the add functionality. If get source is equal to the clear button, then you might want to do the clear functionality and so on. So it's all about getting source. Next figure coming up shows a JFrame reacts to a button click. We're importing the event package, which is what we've done. Within the action perform method, the string that the user typed is in the J text field is retrieved and stored in the name variable and then used in the second J label. So it's doing something different to what we're doing. It's uh, getting the user input and displaying it in a label. We're gonna get the user input and put it into a text area. Okay, so you can see implements action listener. And then press me is the button name, press me is the J button, press me, add action listener this, and then we've got an action performed here. Okay. And if we had multiple buttons, we'd add the listener to each button. And then we'd have to say, if E dot get source is equal to the press me button, then do this code, else if E dot get source is equal to the other button, then run this code and so on. So we'd have a big if else if here, depending on which button was clicked. Okay, so bit of a nasty way to do it. Oh, okay. Before we go on to improving this code, let's just have a look at multiple sources. So this is the code I was talking about earlier. Um, so you can add more than one event source to a listener and, um, and you can, there's a whole lot of ways you can determine the source. Um, so object source is equal to whatever that chap there is, whatever that uh, parameter there is, it's e.getSource. So you can say if source is equal to the button one, then do that the code else. If source equals button two, do that code and so on. Or actually look at what the source, the type of the source is. So you can go instance of text field. So if the text field is what uh, was involved, then you can you can uh, run some code. Bit of a dangerous way to do that because what if you've got multiple text fields? Okay, so this, this is the normal way you'll see it written, something like this. Um, okay, so let's look at activating these buttons in our code. So you can see there the code was quite, we had to do all this stuff. Oh, let's go back to the other example. Had to do all this stuff here, had to do all this stuff and add implements action listener. Let me show you the modern way, which is much simpler. So we're going to go add action listener. 
say event. Add button, dot add action listener. Make sure you spell that right, listener. It's easy to get wrong. Uh, event with a, a minus and a greater than sign. And then a method name. And we're going to write this method and that's going to handle our button clicks for that, for that button. Okay, so we need to come down here and add, an, add a new method. Okay, so that's, that's the code I just added there. Just getting down to the code here so I can start typing it. I'll take out some blank lines. Okay, so when they click the, the add button, the add details method will run. Okay, so Java will come down and look for a, an add details method and run it. And we can see this running if you like, just for now, we we'll just put a system out print line statement there, system out dot print line, add button clicked. Just for fun, we'll just place some text to the console screen. The last thing we'll talk about quick briefly is I, I said earlier on in, in an earlier class, Keep all your data private, and this is a very good reason for it to be public, and it very rarely is. And I said, keep your methods as private as possible, okay? And a constructor's got to be public, otherwise this class can't be created or this object can't be created. Um, but this method here, do you want to call from outside your class? And I would suggest probably not. So I'll make that a private method. So it can't be called from outside the class, okay? It's not doing anything dangerous, but it's just good idea to make your methods private unless there's good reason for them to be public. And really the only place we want this method called is when the user clicks that button. So make it private. Okay, control one, control two. So when we click that add button now, see the add button clicked appears in the console window? Add, 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 add. I'm clicking multiple times and it appears multiple times. Okay. So we'll wide up the button to the to, to uh, some code that runs when it's clicked. We can also do the we can also use um, we can also add that text to the text area. Output text area dot set text. We'll also add that to the text area. Add text not text. Yeah. Output it text area dot set text. Add button clicked. So when I click the add button, that that message will appear in the text area. Control one, control two. Okay, you can see it's appearing there as well, but it only appears once because we're doing the set text. So anything that was there originally is gone. Okay, so if you want to append the text onto what was already there, you could say dot append and then add a new line. Um, I'll put a new line at the end as well. So maybe instead of set text, use the append method, which is another method available for text areas. So now every time we click the button, we'll get add button clicked plus a new line added into the, into the text area every time I click a button. Okay, control one, control two. Add, 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 add. And you can see there the first one's getting added to the end of inputs, please. <laughs> so maybe we want to put a new line before that instead of after it or whatever, I don't know. Or maybe we want to put, put a new line after that. So the, uh, just so the add button doesn't run up against it. Okay, so let's, let's compile that and run. I'll close down some windows. Control one, so I just changed that to have a slash n after it. For the set text, into in, in, in inputs please, plus slash n. And down here I've got add button append, text area append add button click to slash n. Control one, control two, add, 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 add. You can see that it's just being appended onto the text area. Okay, so we've got a button that's wide up. 
And every time the user clicks it, a bit of text is being added to the text area. Let's warp up the clear button while we're at it. Let's warp up the clear button. And clear button dot add action listener. Okay. Event. So when an event occurs, when someone clicks on a button, we're going to run the clear details. The one we click the add button, the add details is called automatically. And when we click the clear button, the clear details method is called automatically. So let's now write this button, this method here. So we'll now write the clear details method. So another method, private, private avoid clear details. And what do we want to clear? Well, maybe we just want to clear the text area. Okay, so that big, that big results area where we're getting the appends getting added to, uh, well, we just want to clear that. So easiest way to do that for us is output text area dot set text to an empty string. So when the add button's clicked, this code will run. When the clear when the clear button's clicked, this code will run. Control one. Control two. Add 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 and clear, and everything's gone. And add 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 and clear, and everything's gone. Okay, so we've wired up two buttons now. Now. Right. And uh, and, they're, and they're both fully isolated. Okay, so this this add button or the, the method that runs when the add button's called can't cause any side effects on other buttons. Okay, the way you the way I'll show you that's done later on in the lecture, you can have side effects between buttons, which is. Um, Something this code avoids completely. This method runs when the add button's called, and this method's run when the clear button's called. Now you've got to be careful with Java. Each, each button can have many listeners. So if I add that listener multiple times, so I've added it three times to the button, okay? So it'll fire off three times when the, when the button's clicked. So when I click the add button now, I'll see the Add button click appear three times. Okay. One more click and another three times. Okay. So if you find your buttons running multiple times and they shouldn't be, just click your click your add listener commands. Okay. It means you've done it multiple times. Okay. Another really easy thing, thing to do is to do this. Okay. You change this method, but you forget to change the button. So now the add button's going to add the details and then clear them. <laughs> so, no, so it's going to appear like nothing's happening. Okay, so again, if your buttons are getting clicked, the first thing I'd do is I'd put print line statements in the methods, make sure the code's coming out on screen, and then check your listeners. And you've probably got something like that going on. Okay, so it's very easy to add multiple listeners to a button. So can you have listeners that react to left mouse button clicks, right mouse button clicks, mouse scrolls? Absolutely, you can do all that sort of stuff. It's, it's pretty easy in Java too. Okay, so that was the old way of doing it. And I showed you the new way where you don't have to worry about action performed, action event E, implements action listener. You don't have to worry about that, any, any of that stuff anymore. It's just, give me, give, give me the event that runs when that uh, button is, when that method is called. Okay, so when that method is called, when that button's clicked, that, that method's called. When that button's clicked, that method's called. Uh, one other thing I'll talk about as well is you, we've added a, an action listener. Action listeners are to do with mouse clicks, usually, usually on buttons or menu items, but you can also assign change listeners so that when a field changes, code is automatically run, and you can have item listeners, change listeners, all sorts of things. Okay, so code fires off when all these other things are run. This is just an action listener, so when a mouse clicked on a button, this code runs. But there's other types of events you can handle as well.
So, so you can add more, you can add more than one event source to a listener, and that's coming up shortly. But uh, I've showed you a much better way to do it. That's a much better way to handle your listeners. Have a separate method that runs much easier, much cleaner. Um, we've already looked at this code. Set enable method. You can make things unavailable if you want. Uh, so if we, if we want to make a button disabled, we could say clear button. So it's set enabled. False. Our clear button's not enabled anymore. So I can't click it. Nothing happens. Okay, it's just disabled. So you can, you can do that sort of thing whenever you like, set buttons enabled or disabled, depending on what the state of the program's in. Um, you might set the clear button to disabled by default. And then after they do an add, you could set the clear button to enabled. So set it to true, because now there's something to clear. And when they clear the details, there's nothing to clear anymore. So set it back to disabled. Okay, so if you click the clear button, if they click the add button, we can set the clear button to enabled. So there's something to clear. And uh, when I click the clear button, set it back to disabled because there's nothing to clear. So you can prevent the user from doing things if you want to by depending on what state the program's in. So let's sort of have a look at that. Control one, control two. And I'll see it's disabled by default. I'll go add and it's enabled. So add, 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 add. It's enabled because so there's stuff to clear. Clear. There's nothing to clear. So now it's disabled. Add again and it's back to being enabled. Okay, so you can do that for all your, all your components. You can do it for text fields, text areas, buttons, just set enabled or set editor enabled for, for input fields. You can do set it editable or you can set enabled for text areas as well. But for buttons, it's usually set enabled. Set enabled is the best way to disable them. Well, the only way really. Okay, so set enabled for buttons. And that turns them on and off, make them so they're clickable or not. And uh, set editable for data entry fields, like text areas and text fields. Cases that respond to user initiated events must be implement an interface that deals with events called event listeners. Many types of listeners exist in Java. There's change listeners, there's item listeners, there's action listeners, there's all sorts of things. A class can implement as many event listeners as it needs. An event occurs every time the user types a character or clicks a button. Okay, so you can do that as well if you want. You can react to any type of button on mouse click or mouse click or mouse wheel or whatever you want. Okay, so this is just some of the listeners in Java. Action listener, adjustment listener, when you're scrolling scroll bars, change listener, focus listener, when you're changing input, when you're changing focus from one input field to another, for example. Uh, item listener, Key listener, mouse listener, mouse motion listener, Windows listener, and, um, and there's many others. So basically whatever you want to do, you can do. So you can create relationships between swing components and classes that react to user manipulations of them. Um, Okay, so checkboxes respond to user clicks and, um, and to react to mouse clicks on those, you add item listeners to those. Okay, so if you want code to run when a user clicks a checkbox, you add an item listener. Okay. Um, and there's a general form. So the source of the event, whatever that is, add whatever the listener is, and then the something that should respond. And now that I've showed you the new, the new way, you know you can write code like this in there. So you have to have the old implements action listener, comma, action item listener, comma, change listener, and then all those classes and methods down below. I'm just, it's just you can do this simple way, which is fantastic. And this came in with Java 7, which simplified things a lot. So buttons, checkboxes, combo boxes, text fields, and radio buttons, they can react to action listeners or action, yep, action listeners, scroll bars or adjustment listeners. All swing components, you can have key listeners and all sorts of things going on. Uh, buttons, checkboxes, combo boxes, and also react to item listeners. Um, you can add window listeners for the window and JFrame components, change listeners for sliders and checkboxes. So there's many ways to do things. There's not just one way to skin a cat. 
So some, sometimes it depends on what sort of event you're listening for, and other times it just depends on what the component is and what you're trying to do. So it's a very deep area. We could spend uh, we could spend a term just on listeners <laughs> in Java. Um, we're not going to do that though. The class of the object that responds to an event contains a method that accepts the event object created by the user's action. So in other words, buttons react to action listeners and, uh, and so on. If you declare a class that handles an event, create a class to do one or more of the following, implement the listener interface or extend the class. That's the old way of doing the code. I'll show you the simple new way, which is much, much simpler. The old way was much more complex. If you declare, if you declare a class that extends my, fr my frame, you implement item listener, comma change listener, comma action listener. You don't have to do any of that anymore since I've showed you the new code. Just, just remember that, much easier. Besides J buttons and text fields, several other Java components allow a user to make selections in a GUI, a GUI environment. There's menus, for example. Uh, J checkboxes. No, let's do a J checkbox. A J checkbox. Um, and we'll do it up here before the buttons or before the text area. J checkbox. J checkbox. Deluxe. I'll, I'll, assume, I'll assume, what are we adding? So what are we adding for our names and ages? What sort of people or um, we, could have, we could pretend we're doing a, a hotel, if you like, or a, a plane. Uh, so meal required. A checkbox meals required. I don't know, whatever we're doing, whatever you want a checkbox for. <laughs> Place a string. Okay, so J checkbox. Be careful, it's uppercase C, uppercase B. Don't put lowercase B. And uh, uppercase C, uppercase B. So we're going to have a couple of checkboxes and uh, Meals, leg room, leg room. Okay, so next for leg room, I don't know what we're doing. <laughs> it might be some sort of movie theater or aircraft or something. Okay, we've got two new checkboxes there. That's that's messed up on my code, which fingernails on the chalkboard, but I'll, I'll, I'll look past that. Let's add them to our user interface. And we want those before the text area. So I'll go add meal checkbox, add extra room checkbox. That's two lines of code there. Control one, control two. And there's our checkboxes appearing. So you can see they've got a nice little area you can check into. It's got a nice sort of metallic look, silver and metallic. Again, everything just scrolls up the page if we move the page up and down. Okay. Everything just scrolls around like crazy because it's all flow layout at the moment. Okay. And uh, and if you want to if you want to set the, the meals required checkbox to enabled by default. We could do that anywhere we like. We could do that here. Dot set. Um, it's selected. True. Okay. The set selected means you're making the checkbox checked by default. So when you run that code, there it is. It's got a tick in it already when we run the app. Okay, so it's got a default value of ticked. And if you want to see if a, if a checkbox is selected, you could say if meals required checkbox dot is selected. That's true. Then it's been checked. Okay. We'll use that code in a little bit down in our add method. So there's a bunch of checkboxes there. Checkboxes, you can have. You can select multiple or none if you want. Okay, 
There's also radio buttons and radio buttons, you've got to have one selected and you can only select one in the group. Okay, so there's radio buttons as well. Um, and with checkboxes, guess what? Set text is there and get text is there and set selected or is selected are the other two main methods you'll use. Set select to true or false to make it ticked or not and is selected to check whether it's checked or not. Okay, still got seven students, so we lost one person, but that's okay. Um, any questions so far on anything on button activation, on checkboxes, on... Anything so far? One thing, one thing I'd probably do as well is I'd, I'd, I'd set all the properties together. So wherever I set the properties of GUI components or the defaults, I'd do those all together as well to keep it all together. So it's just one place you need to look. Okay, so let's set the properties. If you want to put some comments in your code, you could say, um, the UI, add components to UI. Set default values and settings. Chunk of code. Um, that one that's tooltips. And that sort of thing. Just sort of comments like that is probably all you want to add. Back to the slides. No questions? No? Okay. Um, uh, there's item, when, when the status of the checkbox changes, in other words, when it goes from checked to unchecked, there's an item state changed method. Okay. Uh, that executes. Hmm. And that's all we do on that. That's all we do on that for now. So you can react to checkbox clicks as well, just like we did react to button clicks. You can have code automatically run if you implement an item state change method. Button groups, uh, when you've got radio buttons, so we'll do, let's do some radio buttons as well. Okay, radio button. Visa. Visa card radio. Visa. There's a new J radio button. Visa, so how are they paying? Visa, um, Amex or MasterCard, MasterCard, Master. For, for radio buttons as well, you also need a button group. Button group. Okay, so credit card buttons group, we're going to add our radio buttons into that group and we're also going to add them to the user interface. By adding them to the group, you're telling Java that these all act as a single unit. When one is clicked, the other one can't be clicked or the other ones. Let's add another one just so we make it clear. And uh, Amex. Or whatever, whatever you want to add in. So I'm going to copy this code down below so I've got all the, all the fields handy to me. Control C. I'm going to copy it down into here. And I'm going to use a button group. So I'll add. So we're going to add our buttons to the button group. And we're going to also add them to the user interface in the order we want them. Okay, so we're going to do three add commands here to add them to the group. And then three add commands to add them to the user interface. Okay, so add that to the group, add it to the user interface. Add the MasterCard button to the group, add it to the user interface. Add the Amex card to the group, and also add it to the user interface. Okay, 
delete that code. We don't need that anymore. That'll just cause errors. So delete that code. Okay, so for each radio button, we're adding it to a group, the credit card button group. And you've also got to add it to the user interface. Make sure you add it to the group. Otherwise, you can have multiple radio buttons selected and you'll be saying, they don't work right, what's going on? Control one, control two. And you can see what three, three radio buttons there, Visa, MasterCard, Amex. You can only have one selected. With the checkboxes, you can have both selected or none selected. Okay. But with radio buttons, you can only have one of the group selected at a time. If you wanted Visa to be the, the, the default radio button, we could make that the default by saying, do that down here in our default section. And it's the same sort of code as that, set selected to true. Okay, so Visa radio button selected by default. So run that, control one, control two, and you'll see when I run the app, there it is selected by default. Before nothing was selected by default. Now, now the Visa is. Okay, any questions so far? We're running out of time, last 10 minutes or so. We've only got a few slides to go. Um, so that's checkboxes and radio buttons. There's our button group, there's our checkbox. So you can also, you can also do radio buttons with checkboxes. You can add checkboxes to a button group and then they behave like radio buttons, okay? But uh, with swing, there's a proper radio button component. So that's, that's actually the, the more correct way to do it, it's use J radio button. But you can also do it with checkboxes and add the checkboxes to a group. Then the little square becomes round and you can treat them just like radio buttons. Okay, so that's, what this, that's what this slide here is doing, but it's the old way of doing things. Much better to use the, the proper J radio button component. Also a combo box, if you want to add stuff to a combo box or a little drop, drop down box, you can do that as well. There's a, one with three options there. Let's create a quick combo box just quickly. J combo box, make sure it's uppercase C, uppercase B, and we'll make it, um, what do we make it? Um, plain type. It was new. J combo box. Okay. Now there is a trick you can do here. You can actually provide the values that are in the combo box now at compile time. To do that, we'll create a little string array up atop here with our constants. Public static terminal string. Square brackets. Don't forget your square brackets. It's, it's an array. And I'll call it plain types. And I'll say it's got the values 747, 737, I don't know. <laughs> and that's about the end of my plain knowledge. <laughs> okay. So we could be we could be flying to a little country airport. So Cessna might be the right plane. We could be flying between capital cities or countries, 747. We could be just flying between little cities in Australia and 737 might be enough or something, I don't know. Whatever you want to type there anyway, just separate the values by commas and put a closing curly bracket and a closing semicolon. So curly brackets, semicolons, uh, commas separating the values and then a semicolon at the end. So that plain types chat there, that array, you can use it down here in your combo box. Just put plain types. Now, one thing Java does like with combo boxes as well is there can be many different types of data in combo boxes. You can have images and all sorts of things. So Java likes you to say it's a string when you're using strings. So we'll go string. And we're just telling Java that our combo box contains strings. Okay, so. Put a, put a string there and a string there as well. Just keeps Java happy. So we've declared our array of plane types. We've added that array of, of options to our combo box. Let's now add our combo box to the user interface. So we'll add them after the radio buttons. Add plane types combo box. And that's all we need to do. Control one.
Com com combo. I spelled combo wrong. Combo box. Combo box. I spelled it right there, which is funny. I think I spelled it wrong right there. Anyway, little typos. Easy to do. Control one, control two. So you can see there's our combo box with the options. We can choose whatever we like. Okay. And again, when we expand our stuff out, it all gets very messy and it wraps all around the place, but that's okay. We can live with that for now. So the final thing we might do is let's get the data out of our data entry boxes and, um, and we'll add it into the, into the text area. Okay, so instead of just adding the button was click to the text area, we'll, we'll, uh, we'll add some proper data. So string, out string is equal to, so we'll get the, get the data out of the name text field. And how do we get data out of a text field? Get the age text field. Data out of an age text field. Anyone answer that one? There's six people still left, but we've got a few people there. If anyone can answer, how, tell me how to get data out of a text field, that'd be great. Um, we also want to get the data out of a combo box. Combo box. So plain type combo box. Get text. Beautiful. Thanks, Byron. Well done. So it's just get text, set text. That's really all you need to remember for a lot of the time. Get text. Okay. And then get text. Okay. How do you get the selected item out of a combo box? <laughs> Haven't done it yet. So get selected item. It tells you what the item was in the combo box. It would be nice if it was get text, but it's not. I could put name before that and age before that. So little bits of labels if I wanted to. I'm not going to worry about doing that. Okay, so. Uh, we've got three of our inputs. What about the credit cards combo box? So here we need to do an if statement or a switch. Switch or an if. If, if statement's better. If, no, if statement's better, sorry. So if meals required. So we'll do a checkboxes first dot is selected true we're going to add some data onto our text plus equals meal required and you could do an else here if you wanted to and say no meals required if you wanted to do that okay let's do the radio buttons so we've got Visa, Amex, and MasterCard. I'll copy that code down there so we can use it. Copy it down there temporarily. And if Visa is selected as true, else if MasterCard selected as true, else if Amex card is selected as true, else if. Okay, so if it's We'll set some spaces on after it. Meal required. Okay, plus spaces. And it's easy card. Otherwise, it's MasterCard. Otherwise, it's Amex. Otherwise, it's non okay so now when i click the edit the uh the the add button we'll get the name text field add some spaces onto it age text field add some spaces onto it the plain type combo box we'll get the selected item in the combo box okay if the meal is required, we'll say meals required. What was the other? We had another checkbox here as well. Um, 
extra leg room. All right. If extra leg room isn't is required, we can say extra leg room. No meals, meals required, extra leg room. What type of payment they're doing, and then we can set that text into the text area. So output text dot append outstream plus a new line. So we're building up outstream with all the details of the inputs, and then we're displaying them in the text area by appending it to the text area. Okay, so getting our text fields, getting our selected item, checking which checkboxes are selected, and uh, and then checking the radio buttons as a group, and then uh, generating the output out, out string, and then setting the output text area to include that at the bottom. Let's run out and see where we look. Control one. Uh, 139, 139. Put on something here. Um, where expected. Ah, hang on. There's a round bracket missing somewhere. Oh, else, sorry. Should just be else. I meant to say just else. Couldn't see the wood for the trees. Okay, so if I type in Mike, and I'm only 21, honest, and I want to fly a Cessna, I want to pay Mastercard, I don't want extra leg room, please. So I can stretch right out and click the add button. Mike, 21, Cessna, meal required, extra leg room required, and I'm paying Mastercard. So you can see I'm generating the text there. And I can click add again, add again, add again, add again, and then clear and clear it again. So maybe the last thing you want to do at the end of a ad, you might want to clear the inputs. Okay, so if you want to clear the inputs, clear the name field, put that text to that. You want to clear the age text field. We want to set the plane back to the default plane, plane text field dot set selected index to zero. In other words, set the plane back to the first one in the list. Uh, we want to say that uh, meals required is selected. Set selected to true. So make the true default values. We want to say that um, legroom selected is, is a not default. So legroom selected is false by default. And Visa card selected by default. So we store default values. Okay, so we're restoring default values. Get all the data, display it to the text area, and then restore the default values. Now you might want to do this here, and you might want to do it at the top in your constructor. So why don't you want to maybe you want to make this code a separate method, restore default values method. Okay, so you can save to duplicating that same code in two places. So um, we're not doing any validations at the moment. If we're doing validations, this is where we do them. We do them in the add details method. We check all our inputs. If this input is valid, if, if this input's not valid, display an error message and do nothing else, stop. Else, if this input's invalid, show an error message and return. Don't, don't do anything else. Else, 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 if, else, if, else, if, until everything's checked. And then we can say else, and then we could run all this code here to run when all the inputs are valid. So this code would only run when the input's valid. So that, that would be good to do for you. To do, add validation, inputs, display error, return, if error found. Call in the constructor as well. Just some, just some extra things you can do. 
if you don't do them for Friday, we'll do them in Friday's class. Okay. I'm just running out of time, that's all. So some extra things we'll do there. Um, so we'll move that code to its own method. Its own method and call it in the constructor as well. Uh, let's just have a look at the slides. That's, that's the trick I showed you for building a combo box, set up an array and pass it in, in the constructor. Well, this code doesn't put the string in, which is a little bit naughty. Um, but, uh, there's some of the methods for combo boxes. A whole lot of methods here. You can remove all, you can get item at a certain location and so on. A whole lot of useful stuff there, plus there's many more. So you've got set, set selected item. If you want to say set selected item to 747 or set selected index to zero or one or two or whatever is a valid index in the array. Combo boxes start at zeros like all arrays in Java. And you can get selected item or get selected index if you want to get the item number. So, so get selected index zero, does that return zero? That means they selected the first item in the list. Like it says here. And that's it for this week. So. In, uh, in Friday's class, we'll, um, and also we'll look at needing, needing up the GUI. Uh, so that's your to do there, for that one. Uh, in, in Friday's class, I think I'll just go ahead with slapping a, In, in uh, Friday's tutorial, I think I'll just go ahead and slap a, a, a GUI on a dogs and dogs and dog tester classes. And I'll add the validation and add to these and I'll make it so it's a nice user interface with panels and things. We'll, we'll go on to panel scene. So um, after, you, after you do Friday's tutorial, you should be able to neat up the GUI in this class as well for the lecture example. Okay, so I'll leave that for you to do. Um, okay, that's it for this week. Any final questions before we go? Still got six people here, which is great. Thanks for hanging around till the end. Thanks, Wayne, and thanks, Byron. Thanks, Sanjin. Um, any, any other questions or anything? Okay. Um, are you putting that lecture GUI example on your GitHub before Friday? Yep, yep, yep. Just, oh, it'll, You won't be fast until the end. There. Yep, it'll be up there very shortly. Okay, thanks for that. And um, I'm recording the videos locally to my hard drive now, so I'll be able to process that and get it up and Get it up within a couple of hours as well. I've got a bit, an hour or two of editing to do, and then I'll get, get it up there. Okay, thanks a lot. Thanks, Mike. Nice day and do lots of coding. Yeah.